Some refer to it as the last wild frontier of the eastern United States. In the heart of Maine's expansive wilderness lies a place where time seems to stand still, where the old growth trees that merely miss being set asail whisper tales of an era forgotten by many. Nestled at the highest point in the northeastern United States, Maine is host to a vast expanse of land, from the southernmost tip bordering New Hampshire's seacoast, north to the border of Canada. Here, you can find Maine's North Woods. While not a true wilderness untouched by man, these woods are a largely remote and undeveloped region of the country. By the early 19th century, the Allagash was a major hub for logging activity, where just south, Bangor had become the world's largest shipping port for timber, only to shortly be succeeded by the uncharted economic promises of the West. Through the early 20th century, much of the dense, ancient forests were harvested by hand, utilizing few tools, and nearly limited to axes and cross-cut saws. The logs were brought from the woods guided by oxen and horses, where they were handed off to the raw power of the rivers, to where they floated south to the mills, waiting to feed the insatiable appetite of America's growing urban industries. But if you're not from Maine, you might not know the Allagash River runs north. In efforts to increase profits and maximize efficiency, these timber companies reversed the course of its flow, raising the water level of lakes through dams and created canals that shifted the direction of the river southbound. In 1901, logging was changed forever. The invention of the lumbar log hauler, a steam locomotive that predated the bulldozer and skidder, could be trusted for much longer hauls through the woods when animals couldn't. This saved the need for multiple other dams being constructed along the waterway, as they often relied on the rivers when the terrain proved untraversable. While this state-of-the-art invention expedited the process and ultimately led these big timber companies towards an even bigger fortune, it inadvertently saved the waterway from further destruction. By the early 1900s, concerns over deforestation and the ecological impact of logging spurred a conservation movement. In 1966, the Allagash Wilderness Waterway was established preserving over 92 miles of rivers and lakes throughout the Maine's North Woods. A true testament to the enduring spirit of conservation. As you might have put together by now, the story of the Allagash has been through many chapters in its lifetime. The region is now administered by a combination of private and industrial timber companies, as well as state government agencies, ultimately allowing access for public recreation. Logging, conservation efforts, and the intricate relationship between man and nature stretch back tens of centuries where Native Americans inhabited the banks of this area, utilizing it to fish, hunt, and forage. Notably, traversing this relentless terrain by canoe. And if you wondered what the word Allagash means, it happens to derive from the Abenaki Penobscot language meaning bark stream. Aside from its rich history and conservation successes, for anglers like ourselves, these woods are a sanctuary, 
a reminder that much of the northeast was once a myriad of pristine waterways full of self-sustaining native fish populations, including brook trout, for what we had mainly come back for. Bob Johnson, registered Maine guide and family friend of the Yoders, welcomed us to his hand-built lodge and two encompassing side cabins where we would stay for the coming days. Making quick use of our time, we crammed in a small lunch and unpacked our gear. A reminiscent melody echoed past us, cleansing the maddening black flies that had greeted us at the dock. A pair of loons pursued a school of darting fingerling brookies that were making slight disturbances in the pond surface. It was finally settling in. We were here. As we were towed out to the far side of the pond, I felt the overcoming of goosebumps that made the hair on my arms stand tall. My next blink flooded with flashbacks of a monumental visit to these exact woods. One that left me wondering why I often have vivid dreams of running through this relentless wild to find what else there is beyond it, when what I'm dreaming of is right in front of my eyes. I brought myself back to the present, we sat and watched Lucas make an entrance into a familiar trance. The pond's locals glided to the surface to show off their summer hues all around the canoe. In sync, Aiden and I grabbed our paddles to give us some distance. Just as fast as my flashbacks came and went, Aiden's fly was out and skating across the glass-like surface, disappearing into the crisp tan and stained water. As we sat down for dinner, hopeful to meet the evening hatch, Bob recited how in his lifetime he had seen the Algash lose some of its premier ponds and rivers, having fallen victim to the introduction of non-native species, strikingly, as a result of selfish and uneducated fellow anglers. Much of the North Woods, in Maine for that matter, is made up of an interconnected system of lakes and ponds, with minuscule streams being the veins of the land. Some ponds, more reliant on the underwater springs that bring them life, survive in their own intricately unique ecosystems. Famed author and frequent writer of Maine, Lou Dietz, voiced that a visit to the wild calls forth a response that it is in sense of recognition. It is a returning, a fulfillment of a hidden need for life renewing communion with the vapors of earth. The next morning we fished early before breakfast. The cool north air and cloudy skies made way to dark tumbling clouds. As the wall of rain came across the pond towards us, we paddled our way back to the dry cabin and a warm meal that awaited us. 
We dozed off in the lodge until early afternoon, when the rain eventually broke and the sun peeked out. Bob wanted to introduce us to a special pond he still holds close to his heart. One that was reclaimed from non-native rainbow smelt decimating the local stronghold of bluebacks and the resident brookies as well. The illegal stocking of non-native game fish and the use of live bait in certain restricted waters have nearly, if not totally, wiped out the native populations that once thrived in these places. He said I'm dumb but I'm not stupid. Come on, you guys. Stopping along the way, we passed the time wading up an ice-cold spring-fed stream. Wandering the narrow turns and dense bush to see what the next corner had to offer. Eventually, calling it quits and leaving the trout alone, we kicked up our feet in the shade for a lunch of warm sandwiches and mouth-puckering dilly beans. Once abundant across Maine and parts of New Hampshire, the blueback trout, also known as sunnipe trout or arctic char, can now only knowingly be found in 0.02% of Maine's lakes and ponds. The seemingly once limitless resource has been catastrophically affected by human interference, oversight, and near abandonment for such a quickly fleeting population. As part of an ongoing project co-sponsored by the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and Sportsmen's Alliance of Maine, the Maine Chapter of Native Fish Coalition has made the effort to post informational signs on Maine's dedicated state heritage fish waters. The idea is to let anglers know what the threats to wild native fish are and the laws in place to protect them. Luckily, Bob and I ended up in the same canoe. Bob grunted every now and then when an opportunistic brook trout rose to the surface. He was unhappy they would actively feed in the warm midday surface water. We fished the parameters with Aiden and Lucas following for a second chance behind us. With a subtle hit and a quick set of 90 plus feet of fly line, I could tell I had what we were looking for. The deep orange outline and pale summer colors of the blueback emerged from the cold depths and into sight. Rod held high in one hand, I fumbled to pick up my camera and hit record in hopes of sharing a moment that not many anglers have the chance to experience. At the end of my line, the hero shot to share with the world, ready to be framed and focused, or the delicate life of one of Maine's rarest native fish, far from its deep, glacial home. A gust of wind barreled through the trees and flushed across the water, filling my ears with sounds of rustling leaves and white noise. My rod tip poetically bowed in the wind towards the stern, leading the now fatigued blueback past the yokes into the edge of the canoe, where Bob, patiently sitting with forceps in hand, unhooked this resilient fish without a touch. I often find myself living once-in-a-lifetime moments through a viewfinder. I find great fulfillment in sharing unique experiences with those that may not have the same opportunity to do so, or to look back and revive my own biological need to feel. Yet during this trip to the Allagash, I came to understand that not all moments are meant to be shared. Some things are meant to remain unseen by others, leaving for the opportunity to create a sense of curiosity and wonder. It is often for the better that people see through their own viewfinder, creating their own meaningful connection, and leading them towards an inner need to preserve that experience for themselves and others. But how do we get people to care for something they've never truly felt before? 
had the whispering winds of the Allagash made me feel? Did it tell me that ever so precious creature is worth far more than just another fishing story? It is our responsibility as an angler, and a human, to understand the ecological impact we have made on these delicate ecosystems, and figure out practical solutions to protecting these resources from further harm. For in the heart of the North Woods, amidst the whispering pines and ancient rivers, we find not just a destination, but a journey. A journey that beckons us to explore, cherish, and to think beyond this wilderness. These woods are still a working forest today, and have bound back from many generations of our own mistakes. Let us look elsewhere and use it as a blueprint, for we must feel inside the Allagash and listen to its cue. As we've seen, not all things that seem lost are actually gone. These places are resilient, just like those that call it home. And when you walk through a wild place like this, you find yourself feeling far less powerful than you might have once imagined. But together, we make power. Power to change, to adapt, and to right our wrongs. We are losing our wilderness at a frightening rate, and nature is starting to knock on our doors angrily. How many of us are truly willing to open that door? 